I'm Melissa Nielsen with Waldorf Essentials. And, and today we're going to talk about um, Waldorf and the Common Core. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, sort of um, what makes Waldorf Essentials even um, more appealing when it comes to the Common Core. So, the Common Core is this um, thing in the United States that we have to deal with. But um, even if you are not in the United States, if you're in another country, um, it's likely that you have to deal with um, some standards in your province or area as well. So um, we're going to talk about the Common Core specifically, but um, I definitely think that this can go across for any standards. And um, really, my aim today is to have you not be afraid of them. When um, I started thinking about, you know, how to put together the common, the, the stuff that I put together that I'm going to talk about, it was, um, it was, um, it was several years ago. We mm -hmm. were, um, I was actually in the, um, in the middle of um, extra proceedings with my ex-husband, um, and he just was demanding that we, um, that we meet the state standards with regards to our homeschooling. And unbeknownst to him, everything we were already doing was already meeting the state standards. Um, I'm one of those people that when something is put before me that looks really complicated and scary, um, I put my hat on from um, my years of being pre-law years ago, and I decide to research it to death. And so I did that. So I, I pulled it out, and um, I started to really understand that there is a huge difference, and a lot of families don't know this. Actually, a lot of educators even don't know this. <laughs> There's a difference between the Common Core standard and the Common Core curriculum. Big difference. Good morning to everybody who's watching. So, so to understand the difference, you have to understand that the curriculum was written after the standard. So often when people say, does this, um, does your curriculum, meaning ours or any curriculum in general, does it adhere to the common core? Well, yes, it, any curriculum can adhere to the common core, any curriculum. It's all about how you um, look at and read those standards. So there's a difference between, like I said, the standards, the standards are really just the, um, what they want children mm -hmm. to know in a certain time frame. The Common Core curriculum, well, that's a whole different animal, and and um, it's what they're using directly in the public schools. Um, it's generally not state mandated. What the part that that generally is state mandated mandated is to um, to be able to reach the Common Core standard. And so, I would be very careful with interchanging those words, and I would be very specific. When you talk to somebody about it, any in any official capacity, if somebody says, "Oh, I don't care what curriculum you use," like if you're in a charter in California, say, "I don't care what curriculum you use as long as it adheres to Common Core standards." <laughs> okay, got it, done. Um, but if they say, "I want you to use the Common Core curriculum," then you have to say, "Okay, you need to show me that. You need to show me what what you know what you're you're um, you're recommending there because our curriculum, any curriculum." can meet the standard. And um, and so I want you to be very careful with that wording. Mm -hmm. Like I said, most people do not know the difference between the standard and the curriculum. And so um, hopefully I'll um, send you away today armed with some more information. The standard is, um, again, I think it's very, um, it's, it's, it's not very hard. I think that it's, a lot of people get tripped up on it because of the wording. And um, so you have to break down the wording. And we've actually done that. We have a document um, that is not very much money. It's like $14 um, that we put together. And actually, if you have Thinking, Feeling, Willing, you already have this. If you have, um, if you have a Writing Your Own Curriculum course, you already have this as well. It is just the, um, the portions of that, of that course that go through all of the Common Core Standards. And we, we talk about what each standard is, how Waldorf meets it. So when it comes to state testing, let's just cover that right off the bat. Many states require testing at different intervals. And it, the reason why they require testing at different intervals is to be frank and honest, they cannot afford to test at every state or at every level. And so they, they test at intervals. And so um, that interval is often, um, depending on your state, 
I've, I've lived in Idaho, Utah, now California. Um, it's often like first, third, fifth, seventh. It's like these benchmark areas that they, that they, um, that they recommend. Um, some also uh, test in kindergarten. The state of California allows you to opt out of any and all testing, always, um, as a state right. I don't know how long we're going to have that. Um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, things going on with the California education system. And so I, I, say, I say what I'm saying now as like light because I'm not sure that that's going to be the case for always, but it is the case for right now. You can opt out of testing and um, your child can opt out of testing. Even if your child is in school, they can opt out of testing. Like if they're in a public school, they can opt out of testing. Um, and so, so we have that here. And when we were in um, Idaho and we were with a, um, a charter in Idaho, the testing was required. However, they um, made accommodations for us as homeschoolers. And, um, you know, I was able to say when we were testing, say, on the kindergarten level, um, I was able to say, um, well, we're not doing letters yet. However, here are some things that we are doing. Now, I know that's not always possible. It is it is um, it's possible in some cases you are just going to have to tackle those letters in um, in kindergarten. And I would say that's it's totally OK. Tackle the letters. Remember that reading is a long journey. And 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 what it says that they're doing in kindergarten is not what it's going to say they're doing in grade three. And so, you know, if you have to if you have to jump through some hoops, jump through the hoops, but have fun with it. So you want to have fun with it with your child. And, um, you know, I really like the alphabet book that we just finished with Reg Down. It's a great way to introduce the letters if you have to. Um, and also, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, find out whether or not kindergarten is actually compulsory for your state. If it is not, and there are many states where it is not. So if it is not, I would not even go down the kindergarten road <laughs> at all with the state. Just because you do something at home does not mean you have to do it. You have to be doing it in official capacity. And so, um, you know, I definitely would not go down that road unless you absolutely have to. Um, so then if you have to, then, you know, I would choose something gentle and I would say things like, well, we're working on the letters and, and, you know, just be very confident. What happens is if you're not confident, that's when you, you start to get the, um, oh, well, we should get you some reading help or, oh, we should get you some, you know, X, Y, Z help. If you go in and you're confident, and I mean confident, like you know your stuff, you know what the state standards are, you know what the law says, you know what um, what you have ahead of you, you've talked to other homeschoolers, so you know what you are going to experience when you walk into the testing situation. That will speak volumes to that testing coordinator. So if the testing coordinator knows that you know your stuff and they're not going to push you, it's kind of like... It's kind of like when you go to that doctor's office and um, you don't want an extra prescription for something you don't need and they're trying to write it out for you and you just go, nope, sorry, don't need that. And if you're confident, then they'll leave you be. This is kind of the same sort of thing. Be very confident in what you're, um, you know, what you're doing and how you're approaching it. And it doesn't matter if it's kindergarten or fifth grade. So if you know the law and you know the standard and you've been working on things, that's where I would put your energy. I would, I would walk in and I would be very, um, you know, very much, this is, this is what we've been doing. Um, we're fine to sit down for this test. And, um, and so we've been, we, the Nielsen's have been in, in a spot where we've had to test before. And, um, we had to test through charter school testing when we lived in, um, in Idaho. And, um, then after, after the charter school testing and after I got him to chill out about that, him being my ex-husband, um, then, uh, we ended up doing tests that we took at home and those we just, you can do, there's several different testing programs. So there's the California achievement test that you can send away for. I think there's a couple of others. We ended up actually using test books from Barnes and Noble. And um, they were books that were common core standards. And um, I would spend a couple of weeks and we would go through the workbook and make sure they understood all the verbiage and all of that. And then we would sit down and take the test. And um, that, that worked well. I would suggest that if you have to test in any capacity, that you would do something like that for a practice for your child. Now, I'm also not thinking that you need to spend an insane amount of time on this. So I would do your Waldorf main lesson blocks 
and then, um, you know, have some of these workbooks. Now, uh, like I said, at Barnes & Noble, I cannot remember the name of them. They're big and yellow, and they came for each grade, and they came for each um, subject that they were going to be tested on. So I would go and I would gather those. They were like 6 or $8 a piece. Go and gather them, and we would do our regular lesson blocks, and then about two weeks before the test, we would sit down and that was all we would focus on. And I, I did the absolute best to keep it stress-free and fun for them. Um, one thing to remember that somebody told me in a, from a state capacity years and years ago was, don't stress about what they do on those tests because nobody gets that kicked out of public school. So if you are part of a charter and you are worried about testing, take a deep breath and go, what happens, happens. And, um, you know, I think it's it's hard to make homeschoolers good test takers, especially in the early years. You can definitely help them with that as they get older and their tests get more rigorous and there, there are more parts to those tests. But I would not stress so much when they're younger. Opt out if you can. Um, Get the information on the tests if you can, which, you know, like I said, I would I would get those sorts of booklets from um, from Barnes & Noble. The reason why I liked those was because the words that they used in those booklets were the words that were going to be used on the test. And that's often what ends up happening is that there is a, um, a difference between the words we use at home and the words that, that are being used on the test. And that's where kids freeze up and that's where they get confused. So if you get them used to those words a couple of weeks in advance before the test, then it helps them tremendously. So um, that's testing for the most part. Does anybody have any questions on testing before I sort of move forward and talk about the standard of it? Anybody on your end? No. Every, okay. Everybody good here in Facebook land? Um, okay, I'm going to move on and sort of talk about the standard, and we can come back to testing if we need to, because I really want everybody to feel confident and comfortable, so if there is something that I have missed, please, please, please ask it. So, with regards to the standards, so when you pull up the standards, and the standards are available at the, um, the Common Core website, and I was trying to think if I had the actual website here in my stack of notes. Um... They can be found pretty easily on a Google search. I don't think they're in my stack of notes. Um, I think it's like commoncore.edu or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's fairly easy to find. So you want to find those standards, and they'll be broken out by subject, and they'll be broken out by grade. In some cases, in fact, in many cases, they lump like grades 1 through 3 together or grades 4, 5, 6 together. And so they're just asking for this proficiency by the end of those grades. And um, so I'm going to go through some of what it what it recommends for um, for we're going to start with kindergarten. So with kindergarten, um, the standards say, and, and again, I would not put a child in kindergarten unless your state requires it, and then I would ask the age. So some states require kindergarten at five, some at six, some don't have any compulsory laws. Um, oh, thank you, Becca. Becca um, posted it. It's corestandards.org. So I would look at whether or not your state requires it and what age, what is the latest you can do. So the idea would be that you would be doing K1 off the radar and then K2 um, would be something that you would then enter into if you had to in order to um, meet the state standard. And um, and again, I, I would I would push that as far as you can. And I'm only saying that in respect to making your children very um, ready for any testing that needs to happen and to do that your best to sync up the Common Core age with the Waldorf age. Um, and I do think it's possible. Every state has like different laws for when they can start, when they're supposed to start first grade. So, or when they're supposed to start kindergarten. And so I would look at your state laws. I would also become a... Um, a, a um, member of the Homeschool uh, Legal Defense Association, or at least make yourself familiar with them. They have a lot of information on the Common Core and a lot of information on state standards, and etc. Um, Becca asked, following your curriculum, would we do K-1 during their K-2 year on record? No, if, if it's the on record year, like the year that you're on record, and hopefully that's when they're six or five and a half to six and a half, um, then you would do K-2. Um, so the idea is that you would get them as close to possible as K to K2 age before they're starting kindergarten for real, like like as, with regards to the state. And again, I would not jump through any hoops you don't have to jump through. 
So ask yourself, like, like find out what the actual law is. You know, it's, what was so interesting to me is when we were in um, our court battle with my ex-husband, the judge didn't even know the law. <laughs> it was family court. So I, I quoted the law in the courtroom and the judge was super appreciative of it because they're not educated on the law often. And so, um, it, it, and it's a matter of them needing to go and educate themselves as they've got cases to do, you know, that they have to go through with regards to this. But because I knew it, I had the upper hand, not on the judge, but on the other lawyer. And so I had information that nobody else had because I had done my homework. So if you are in a spot where you have to deal with the state, do your homework. Do not be afraid of this. Handle it head on and 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 really work to go through these standards and see how they match up to, to Waldorf. So back to kindergarten. So one of the standards, it says, um, standards say to be able to identify characters in the story. You can easily do this within the, the Waldorf kindergarten curriculum. So identify characters in the story. The standards also say that they should be able to identify letters and start reading. So again, like I said, I would be super cautious about this. Just because it says start reading does not mean they should read, that they should know how to read. And so again, if you are walking into a testing situation, you can say, well, we've been working on the letters. And that doesn't mean that they're proficient in them. That doesn't mean anything except for that you've been working on the letters. And like I said, I would use a book like um, The Alphabet by Reg Down. Um, there's... Uh, um, oh, there's another one that I totally has left my head. That's a really popular one in Waldorf that we did a lot of years ago. And it's about um, kids on this journey to, through the alphabet. Um, and if somebody remembers the name, please post it. Uh, the Y Sophia, the Y. No, that's my story. <laughs> that's my story. There's another story. I totally has left, left my head. Um, anyway. Uh, I would go very gently through the letters if, if you have to. And, um, and you know, it's just about giving them that taste because it gets better. And that's the, the, the thing too, is, is what often the wise enchanter. Thank you. <laughs> I knew it was wise something. Somebody said the wise enchanter is the story. Yeah. So, um, when you're going through, also remember that, um, because they're not required to know everything in kindergarten on day one, um, that, that if you are testing in any interval with your state testing situation, that they're going to see progress over time. So that's what you need to focus on is progress over time. Nobody expects a kindergartner to have all of that information. As Heather asks the wise enchanter, yes, ma'am, it is. The wise Sophia is my story in grade one. My brain is a little... A little tired this morning. So, so keep that in mind when it comes to those first kindergarten tests. If you don't have to test, do not raise your hand and volunteer to test. Ask if it is required. But if you do, then again, I would be very, very, just still have fun with it. Go very slowly through the alphabet. Um, work on just recognition um, because that's a pre-reading skill is this letter recognition. And so, um, you know, with regards to if you have to test, that's what I would say. Um, make sure you get plenty of movement to counter any of the extra head work that you're doing with a kindergartner. Um, the standards say that they should be able to use a combination of writing and drawing to convey what happened in a story. Um, and so I would say focus on drawing where possible and um, have them dictate to you the um, writing portion and write it down. Um, if you are part of a charter school where you have to turn in work samples, that would be a work sample right there. Um, and you can in late, like, so if you are, if you're K2, true K2, so over six, um, and, and they're forcing you to write because that's what you're being told you have to do, bring in some form drawing. Um, just, just to kind of loosen up their wrists a bit and, and help them with some spatial stuff with regards to writing because that's, you know, form drawing is a pre-writing skill. And so um, it helps a lot in, in loosening them up a little bit. Um, but again, I, only if you have to because I maintain that seven or near seven is the optimal time to start grade one in academics. So only do this should you have to. Okay. Um... It says here, I, I wrote, these are my notes. As for the standards, they like knowing, they like children to know the use of capitals, nouns, verbs. 
There's no way most, most kindergartners know that. And so work on things like, oh, your name starts with a big S. Um, Daddy's name starts with a big, you know, a big E. Or my name starts with a big M. And, and work on things like that. And, and then you're slowly bringing all of that in anyways as they're moving on through the curriculum. Just because the standard says that they want you to be working on this does not mean they have to be proficient. So make sure that you let yourself off the hook, take a deep breath. And knowing the difference between um, big letters and little letters, I think, is helpful if you have to test. And and so then you can go on to, you know, the next step is this is why we use big letters sometimes kind of thing. So you don't have to make it so um, sterile and, and not fun. So just find ways to make it fun. Okay, moving on to grade one. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the grades. I just, I printed out a couple of grades because I wanted to... I wanted to give you the information and have you not feel um, so frustrated and scared. Scared is like what happens a lot. What, you know, I sent out an email last night and um, to remind everybody about the call today uh, or the, the video today. And, and one of the things I wrote is something that happens to me a lot. So I'll spend a lot of time working with a mom. We'll be back and forth, either in email or messenger. We'll get their kids all placed, and and she's super excited to come to Waldorf, and she's like ready to jump in, and she's just just she's all kinds of excited because she knows this is what her kids need, and she knows this is what she needs. And then I get an email that says, "I decided I'm going to stay with the state standards." I'm like, "You don't understand. You can do both. <laughs> you can absolutely do both." So you know, I I want you to leave today feeling like. Okay, I can do both. It does not have to be one or the other because the standard is not the same as the curriculum. So, okay, first grade standards here. The standards say that they should be able to identify key details in a story and recognize key characters. Hmm, sounds a little bit like summary writing to me. Um, they should use story illustrations to identify key parts of a story. Hmm, sounds like our drawing and painting to me. Um... They should understand words, sentences, and paragraphs. And, and most kids that are that age can um, definitely understand um, some pieces. Casey says, the standards are not developmentally appropriate. Public school curriculum is not based on development. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my aim here is really just how do you take those standards and meet them with the Waldorf curriculum. And so I think that, um, like I said before, I think that most Many, I'm not going to say most, many educators do not know the standard difference from the curriculum difference. So you want to make sure that you educate them and you educate yourself first. Um, but I'm go in going through these, these standards for, say, grade one, a lot of them are actually easily met. Um, so phonetic awareness, identifying beginning, middle, and ending sounds. That's something that we're doing by the end of first grade for sure. Um, Understanding long and short vowel sounds. Again, something we're doing by the end of first grade. Um, read grade level text with understanding. So, not sure what they would consider grade level, probably higher, but absolutely can read some words with, with um, understanding, for sure. Um, I think the difference there is understanding. I, I One of the things that I tend to really see with children that are taken through the Waldorf curriculum and taken through the letters and sort of having that more sacred experience, more calming experience, is that their reading has a different depth than, um, it, not saying across the board, but different depth in the beginning where it takes other kids a little bit longer. Um, like I've seen public school kids take more time to really um, get into liking to read, get into understanding the, the words, get into understanding um, the environment, where because we've painted such a picture in the reading we've done with them and for them and the storytelling we've done for them, they have a sense already when they're beginning to read of what's going on around them. So it gives them, there's there's more depth to them. I want to make sure I'm not neglecting anybody on YouTube. No well, questions over there? No, but okay. it seems like things are working. Okay, very good. Um, okay, other things um, with the language arts portion for grade one. Um, 
Printing in upper and lower case. That's something that if you're using our curriculum, you're already working with. Um, and then, you know, also remember that their goal for grade one is not something that has to happen on day one for grade one. Most places that are testing are testing at the end of the year. So you have all year long to be working on these things. And then, like I said, I would take your two weeks or so at the at the end there, right before your test, and I would go through so they understand all the verbiage that they're going to be asked, um, that they understand all of the pieces, and then they're not nervous about jumping into this test. Um, and again, if you can opt out, opt out. Um, so let's see. Uh, with regards to, um, I, I sort of went through all of the Waldorf curriculum, just so that you can see too that there are lots of things that are not uh, required by the state that maybe should be like foreign language, no Common Core requirement there. Um, then we have mathematics for grade one. So the U.S. standards generally only require addition and subtraction. And so Waldorf is leaps and bounds ahead there because we introduce all four main, all four processes on the same day in first grade. So, um, in fact, I will tell you that a lot of um, families that come to us to coming to Waldorf late, maybe they're coming in like third grade, they'll often say, what do we need to do to catch up? Because I see that you're already doing um, subtraction and division, and, and we haven't done that because we're walking in from the public school. So I have them go back to that first, those first stories of first grade for math and have them walk all the way through so that they have no gaps. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly standard in public school to do, um, you know, addition and subtraction first and then multiplication and division later. Um, and, and this way, we give them a whole understanding of how, how those four processes work together. And um, that's very different. It's very different. Um, also, the um, Common Core standards would be discussing word problems in um, first grade. <laughs> Something we already do, right? <laughs> Um, place value, ones, tens, and symbols like greater than, less than, or equal to. So that might be something that you'll have to, because um, that's a second grade, kind of a second grade skill. So you might want to sit down and talk about that a little bit before you walk into your test. But I don't think that that's a, by the end of first grade and you already have those math blocks down, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Um, compare lengths of objects or know which is longer or shorter. I think that one is um, fairly easy. They're probably already doing that in, in kindergarten. You're not, you're not comparing like six inches to four inches generally. You're just going which one is longer, which one is shorter. And, and there again, it helps to have those testing booklets so that you can know the exact questions or the kinds of questions that are going to be asked so you can make sure that you... Um, you know, that you are going through them. Because even if it was, say, um, six inches and four inches, well, your child knows that four inches is smaller than six inches, even if they're not doing a lot of measurement already. So try not to get tripped up on a lot of the, the wording. Okay, shape recognition. Gotcha there already. Um, so I think that with regards to, um, with regards to mathematics, you're going to have zero issues um, with grade one testing. Um, and then one of the things that we do in Waldorf that is not done in um, in public school setting is the home surroundings piece, um, which is, you know, just um, knowing your home and your area. But what I would suggest, if you have to do any social studies work, I would pull this into there because that's kind of social studies, understanding the, the world around you, whether it be just your neighborhood. And I'm not talking about mapping like we do in fourth grade. I'm just talking about understanding the world around you. So Steiner had... Um, had some thoughts on lessons for children to understand their home surroundings. And that, I think, went through about third grade. And then it, transfer, it transferred into sort of this mapping and understanding the greater world around you. Um, music, again, not covered in the Common Core. Um, no year with me in gymnastics. That's not covered either. Um, so there's definitely a lot of holes within the Common Core curriculum. And um, probably a good thing that we don't need to be worried about all of those things because then it would be an, another layer of, um, of involvement that I don't believe that we need. Um, so let's see. Now with grade two. Now I thought this was very interesting. For the most part, um, if you're doing Waldorf, you're going to meet the standard completely because in grade two, um, it says compare and contrast um, two versions of the same story. By the end of grade two, be able to read and understand stories of appropriate complexity. Um, the standard also calls for recalling of stories, identifying who, what, when, where, how, 
understanding key details in the story, fable, or folklore. So, and in grade two, you're you're pretty much if you're using the grade two curriculum, you're you're pretty much covered with regards to language arts. Um, Common Core standards also call for a, ch a child to understand um, inflection in text, bold, italics, and heading. I think this is a stretch for this age. I think it's a stretch for a third grader. However, you can talk about things being different and why they look different and when they're written, why they look different. And I think that that is helpful. You know, so they're already understanding what like things that are in quotations by that point. So you can also maybe introduce, just introduce some of these other concepts. But I really would not stress a whole lot about it because remember, we're not looking for your child to ace this test we're looking for them to do okay on it, for them to feel okay about it, for them to not be stressed out about it, for them to be able to opt out if at all possible. But if they need to take it, then that it's not a stressful situation. And I will say that, um, you know, because we had to do testing for a while, it was a hard thing for my kids. But it was hard because of the situation that it was brought to them in. Um, they, they were very... Um, upset at their father that's a very mild way to put it <laughs> and so um, it, it definitely colored everything that we did with regards to testing and so now that those kids are adults they've had to like when when Harry took the GED because he chose to take the GED um, we had to go through we went through a lot of like getting him comfortable we did a lot of um, the GET, GED test manual, getting him very comfortable with the, the testing and the words and the way they were going to be asking him so that he was not stressed in that situation. My middle son went on to public high school and he, he said it didn't take him long at all to get sort of acclimated to that. It was not a big deal. Some kids are natural test takers. Like that child, <laughs> that child when we took, I remember when we had to do testing at home <laughs> For, for my ex-husband, we that child um, like tested gifted in math. It was kind of crazy. He was doing fourth grade math at or tenth grade math, and he was in fourth grade. And so he, some kids are natural test takers, and it's easy for them. Um, my daughter, she's not a natural test taker. Um, so we're gonna have some we're going to have some things that we'll be you know pushing through over the next six months or so. And that's not a handicap of homeschooling. That's not even a handicap of the Waldorf curriculum. That's that's how children are. Some children are really good at it. Some children with a little bit of prodding can can feel pretty confident at it. Other children just do not feel like they do very well, and they don't like being put on the spot. Maybe they have anxiety about other things. So I think it's very important that we keep those things in mind. And in if you do have to test and you have a child that is um, sort of riddled with anxiety, talk to the test um, the testing coordinator and say, is there anything that I can do? to sort of help my child. My child suffers from anxiety. What can we do to help um, in that situation? And you'd be very surprised at um, some testing coordinators are very um, accommodating. Some are not, but some are very accommodating to um, not just homeschoolers, but because if they were in the public school system, they would also have this anxiety. So, and it would be coupled with something else. So often they are very um, aware and, and, and able to help. I'm not saying always, but often. Um, okay, let's see. Grade two, they go. We go through all of these standards, and and you know, I really feel like um, you're not going to have a problem. <laughs> I think that when it comes to mathematics, you're still ahead in um, mathematics. The Common Core focuses on addition and subtraction still for grade two. Their math facts to a hundred. Um, it does call for an understanding of place value, time, and money, which is are all things you're working on in um, grade two, so it should not be a problem. Um, and in two-step word problems and mental math, this, all of that, all of these things are things that we're or already organically doing within the Waldorf curriculum. It's already part of everything that we're doing. And so I want you to not be so stressed out about these things. I think that... Um, it's really easy to look at the um, at the words state standard and go, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to do that. That's just not possible, and it's absolutely possible in just about every in just about every way. So um, you know, if you're part of a charter school where you have to hand in work samples, there are so many different ways that you can hand in work samples from all of the work that you're doing, that your main lesson book work. Um, your drawings, your writing, um, any extra things that you do. Take pictures. 
I used to take pictures of all the modeling that we did and then made sure that we had all of the writing pieces. It's super helpful, I think, so that you're not sort of um, blindsided. Make a list at the beginning of the year of all of the times that you're going to have to meet with your contact teacher and all of the work samples you're going to have to hand in. So you've got a list and you see it. It's, it's, it's in your school planning or on your fridge or wherever it needs to be. So you can just mark it off as you get them done and set them aside. Put them in a different portfolio so that it's separate. I know a lot of families like to take their main lesson book and show the contact teacher so that they can see all of the work that they've been doing. That's also, I think, very helpful, especially if you have a, a contact teacher that is Waldorf friendly. If you have one that's not Waldorf friendly, then I would be asking around to find one that is, just so that, that you have um, the extra layer of not being so stressed out. I know that in California, um, Inspire, and I have like zero, <laughs> no affiliation, I'm just saying, I know that Inspire has been very good for a lot of families. There are a lot of really good, um, there are a lot of really good uh, charters in California, that if you're using a charter and that's your choice, that um, that you have uh, your bases all covered. I know there is at least one down here in San Diego, a Waldorf homeschool charter. So that's a Waldorf charter school and they've, they've got a homeschool program and I'm pretty sure there's one um, a little farther north as well. So um, I think you just have to really do your homework and really look around if you're going to choose to use a charter. If you're not, if you're sort of doing it like us, we file a PSA every year. Um, we're off the grid with regards to the state. We have to fill in this paperwork and send it in, but they do not police anything that we do. And I like it that way. <laughs> I really like not having to answer to anybody. And so, um, you know, really think about that when you're making the choices. I know why people choose charters. I know that people choose them often. Sometimes it's for a safety net so that you've got, um, you know, they, there's, there's somebody else taking care of your paperwork. Um, and sometimes it's, most often it's because they give you cash. So I totally get it. I totally get that, that families want that that added cash to their budget to be able to do, um, you know, activities and things like that. So I totally understand, but I think you have to stand back and you have to look at what your goals are as a family and whether or not those are hoops that you want to jump through. Because with that, then obviously comes the testing and, and having, um, having more people in your business than you need to. Um, okay, let's see. Um, there's a question here. Have you ever heard of needing to produce work samples from a prior year? As in why you're supposed to keep copies of your tax return for several years. So I wouldn't say, um, I would say that if you're working with a contact teacher, it's the school's job to keep those work samples. But then at home, I do keep generally a year or so behind. When we left Utah, you know, it's just, there's this idea in Waldorf that we keep all of their main lesson books always. And I didn't because we were moving and we had a 10 foot truck and six people. And so I went through all of their um, main lesson books and I made, I took pictures of the ones that I thought were mm -hmm. exceptional. And we went from there and then, and then we threw them all away. And I know that was kind of scary, but um, I've never heard of the state coming back and asking for work samples. Um, are you talking about the state of California? Cause they generally don't, like I don't have to turn in any work samples as a private school. Um, I'm not sure what you would have to do as a, in a charter situation, they should keep your records that way. Now, if you're talking about in a state, because I know there are some states that require you to put together a portfolio um, at the end of every school year, I would say cover your butt and scan everything before you toss it. Scanning everything and keeping it in the cloud. I, you know, we have, uh, I have folders on our personal cloud that have, um, you know, that, that have each grade that we've made copies of for, um, like for filing our PSA, we, I keep, I keep all of that, all of our attendance and everything so that it is, but I keep it electronically. So it's not sitting on my shelf. It's not taking up space. So, um, but in my experience, there's never been anybody that, have, that has come back, no school official that has come back and said, okay, well, I want last year's, um, about last year's information because they should have that if, if you've been if you've been um, you know meeting with the the district if you don't have to, a charter and if you're meeting with, directly with the district they should have you have like okay Susie Cube turned in all their work for last year check the box marked it off and you're done um, so you should not have to 
um, you know, turn that in again. But like I said, it, I would take whatever you've turned into the school and make sure you have good copies, scanned copies of it, and file it away somewhere so that you've covered your basis in case anybody asks. So that's what I would do. Um, with regards to um, other Common Core standards, um, I think that um, that you you can go through and, um, and and really look at what it is that you need and and what it, what it is that they're asking. And in, at every turn, you can meet something for, for Waldorf. I was going to look at some of the upper grades here um, because some of them are actually kind of silly. Like in grade three, um, they, it says creating their own text. Use linking words like because, therefore, and since. Well, sure. Of course they would be doing that, right? <laughs> There's some things that I go, huh? Really? That's all you're asking for? Um, and so it makes you kind of wonder how that's going, that that's um, being put into place in the school setting. Um, in the older, in the older grades, I would go directly. It's not in the document that we have, um, but I, I give you the link. I would go to the actual, because some of the older grades, the, um, the standards are quite lengthy. However, they're, all easy to meet because they're not specific often it's especially with with things like history there's nothing specific it just oh, in science it just says to be able to um, read and disseminate um, scientific information and for history it says to be able to read and understand historical information it's not a um, you have to know about the war of 1812 or anything like that so it's definitely a very subjective and and very much so um, an easy thing for you to be able to meet with um, with your world of curriculum. Um, I'm trying to think here. Does anybody have questions as I'm going through here? I'm looking through my notes. If you've got questions, please ask them. I want to make sure that we cover any any struggles or stressors that you might be having with regards to this because I don't want you to decide, hey, I can't do Waldorf because of the Common Core. That's hogwash. You absolutely can. Um, let's see here. <laughs> um, so this would be grade four language arts. Understand charts, graphs, and diagrams in a technology setting. Um, I think that's fairly easy. Um, determine the meaning of words and phrases in the text. Hopefully they're already doing that. Um, compare and con contrast points of view in a narrative. So in fourth grade, they're doing a lot of stuff with um, the Norse myth, and they actually um, do a lot of like comparing and uh, right within the curriculum. Um, introduce a topic or text clearly to state an opinion. Uh, in my opinion, or in my uh, experience, most 10-year-olds are pretty opinionated, so it's not a problem. Um, link an opinion and reasoning words like for instance and so on. Use pronouns and relative um, adver adverbs. Again, don't be worried and stressed out by any technical jargon. Break it all down and look at what you are actually doing in your schooling. You're already bringing in all of these grammar concepts, and so you're really just making sure that you're crossing those um, T's and dotting those I's with regards to what the standard is. And, um, and so you could use it, perhaps, if you're really worried about it, you could use it for some of your lesson planning to make sure that you, you get in all of those pieces. But I really think that um, you're not going to have a struggle. I really think if you're paying attention to some things, I think you're not going to have a struggle. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do. Um, for mathematics and geometry in grade four, um, working from hold apart. That's really funny. We've been doing that since grade one. <laughs> um, word problems with multiplication and division. Also been doing that since grade one. Number patterns. Understanding place value. Long division and multiplication. So this is fourth grade. Um, compare and add fractions of differing denomination or denominators. So that may be fourth, fifth grade. Um, beginning decimal place value. Again, fifth, later fifth. Um, understanding units of measure. Um, area and perimeter for squ squares and rectangles, um, beginning geometry, points, line segments, angles, etc. So there are some things that don't match up completely. But again, if you're testing over time, they're going to be looking at your scores over time. So don't worry about the, the 
when you go in, it's just a snapshot in time. So do the best you can. That's what I always told my children. Do the best you can. Then we're going to go have ice cream when you're done. So let's just get through it. Do the best you can and, and keep it fun. So I hope this has been helpful. I, I really, um, you know, I, I want to say if you, if you are ever a Waldorf Essentials customer and you're using our curriculum and you are faced with um, needing to needing to really have an understanding of, of either a specific part of a standard or how uh, we can help you meet that standard, all you have to do is email us and ask. We are super happy to help you. You can hop on the Ask Melissa group and, and, and ask. So I would say, I need help. How do I meet the state standard? And then quote the state standard. I'm always happy to help you. That's part of what you get when you get Waldorf Essentials. You get us all. I'm happy to help you in any capacity when it comes to that because I know that it can be nerve wracking and I don't want you to be stressed out. So I want you to be feeling very comfortable and confident that when you buy Waldorf Essentials, that you are buying somebody that can help you for life, that, that we are there to help you with all of these steps. And, and in many cases, in many cases, I have written letters to districts. I have written letters to state, to um, foreign governments saying that we've worked together and, 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 and really been able to communicate to whoever those officials are that you have been working with somebody who knows what they're doing. I do that often. Just wrote two letters in the last two months. Um, just and, and they weren't for the United States. They were for other countries. One I think was for France and one was for England. So you just have to not feel stressed out about it. You, you, you have to realize that when you're working with us, you have somebody that's by your side, somebody that can help walk, you walk through all of the, um, the muck that it kind of feels like sometimes. I also really want to encourage you to not be afraid of this in any capacity. I want to encourage you to go, okay, I can take this on. This is okay. Um, Casey says, if you are with a charter, I think you just need to educate your your CT or your teacher, your contact teacher, yes. Most are former public school teachers and that's all they know. Yes, ma'am. So again, educate, educate. Most are open to learning about Waldorf. That has definitely been my experience. In fact, there have been some charter schools down here in Southern California that they have called and asked me questions. I have sent them, I've actually sent them some of these documents so that they can see how we meet the Common Core Standards, so they can understand it for themselves and um, have always offered for any of the charter schools to do training for them for free because I'm happy to educate them on what it is that we're doing so they can understand it. Often they hear Waldorf and they go, oh my gosh, there are these kids that aren't reading until third grade and all they want to do is talk about religious stuff. Well, that's not the case. So you really have to educate them. And, and, and those are conversations that I've had on the phone with many different charter school, um, you know, directors that they, so that they have the information then afterwards. So I think that that's pretty much it. Do we have any questions over there? No, we don't. You're good over there. Okay, is there anybody else who has any questions or comments? I really wanted to be able to, um, you know, tackle any struggles that you might be having. I think the biggest thing is, like I said, don't be afraid of this. When you're afraid, they know you're afraid. And, and you want to be confident when you're walking into any situation, whether it be testing with a charter school, testing um, in a state capacity where you have to go into another school to test, and, um, and you have to meet with, um, say, district people or an education um, ministry person. Um, I, I want you to feel confident in it. I want you to not feel like you are, um, you know, that, they, they, oh, no, they're going to take my children away. Or, oh, no, they're going to make me go to public school. Or, oh, no, I want you to um, feel confident that you are meeting the things that they need to meet, that they've asked you to meet. That's why you ask questions. So you want to know exactly what it is that they're wanting from you. And um, it's often that they don't want to be very exact. And so I would ask people that have gone through it before. I would get on your local homeschool group and say, hey, I have a meeting with X, Y, and Z. And it's time for to turn in my portfolio or whatever it is that you're doing and ask for recommendations. Say, what have you done? What do I need to worry about? What are my pitfalls here? So you want to make sure that you're keeping attendance if you have to, that you are, you're turning in those, those pieces so that your, your bum is covered. If you're going to go down this road or you live in an area where you have to, 
take care to cover your bases so that you do not get caught with your pants down. When you can take that like that bit of um, prevention, then it, it's, it helps you so much. You know, our last Planning for Peace journal that we just released this year, there's a place in the back for attendance. So just keep your attendance there. It's so much easier. Take your journal in and show them your lesson plans that you have planned out. Show them what you have done. I, I had more than one person tell me that their contact teacher was very impressed with their planning for peace journal because of how detailed it was. So take it in and show them. And then you take in your work samples and show them those as well. Do not be afraid of this process. Being afraid of it and being stressed out about it really just will make you struggle. And so the idea is there's no struggle here. You just do what you're supposed to do and, and turn it in and act confident. That's what you need. So I think that, oh, one more. Um, it's also helpful to find out what score is required in your state. In New York, you have to have a score below the third percentile to be called out and have your homeschool put on probation. Okay, well, that's good to know. So yes, it's very helpful to know all of the requirements for your state. I think that... Um, that when you know one of the things when we when we moved from Idaho to Utah, I was like, oh crap! In Idaho, I had to do nothing. It was great. The only person I had to answer to there was my ex-husband, and so I had hoops to jump through there. But that was different. I wasn't dealing with the state. When I moved to Utah, then you have to like let the district know. You have to get yeah your vaccination paperwork. You have to do all of that. But when I moved to California, it was a big leap. It was a big leap. So it's about educating yourself on where you live and where you're homeschooling. So I, I like this that you said that it that you have to have a score below the third percentile in order to be called out for your homeschool to be on probation. So probation also doesn't mean that you you can't homeschool. It means that hey, we have we've we've identified this area here. We'd like you to get better at it. So rather than taking it as being butthurt about it and being frustrated, just go, okay, well what do I need to do? To sort this out so that we can we can meet these standards so that we can jump through these hoops and so I would listen listen to what they're asking of you and then find a way to meet it and again if you're using our curriculum it's very easy for you to just say hey I got this letter from the state of New York and our homeschool is on probation and, and this is why they said it's on probation so I would say all right let's map out a plan let's map out a plan so that you can show this improvement so I think that um, it doesn't need to be something that you're afraid of. It definitely should be something that you are um, diligent about, especially if you live in a state where you need to be and otherwise move. <laughs> otherwise move someplace where it's not so stressful. <laughs> Idaho, I understand, it's a great place and the borders are open. I'm just teasing. It's also very cold there, um, but a beautiful place as well. Anything else on your end? Okay, I think we're gonna close up. So if anybody has any comments or questions and you're watching this on the download, please feel free to message me. You can catch me on Facebook um, at Waldorf Essentials with Melissa Nielsen, or you are welcome to send me an email at melissa at waldorfessentials.com. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful week. A wonderful week. Bye now.